Is it worth buying a Panasonic S5 II or 2X in 2024? As the year wraps up and comes to an end, I've had my own personal S5 II for over 10 months. I've had some big challenges and managed to figure out what my favorite lenses are and also what my favorite accessories are. And also, I wanna let you know whether I think it's still the best value to purchase next year. Let's kick things off with what I initially intended to use this camera for and why that differs to what I've actually been using it for. When I first placed the order for this camera, my intentions was to use it for capturing and creating YouTube videos like I'm doing right now, and also for capturing BTS moments when I'm out there doing projects on client work. Well, did I underestimate this camera? This camera has truly turned me from someone who preferred manual focusing cine lenses and cinema cameras to someone who now truly appreciates these mirrorless cameras and what the technology can do and assist us moving forward when creating videos. There is one specific factor that pushed me to start using this Panasonic on my projects and client work and I'll get to that later in this video. There's been a trend in the filmmaking industry for decades now that all the new cool technology and features normally starts off in the very top tier, most expensive cameras. And then from there, those capabilities filter down all the way down into the affordable cameras that most consumers buy. I personally think this is changing. We have features like IBIS, dual pixel autofocus and these impressive low light sensors that initially emerged through these affordable lower budget cameras and we're now seeing those filter their way up into these top tier like Hollywood level cinema cameras. Do not underestimate what the S52 can actually achieve like I did and let me show you what this camera is capable of. Let's start with the 4K 10-bit 422. Now this is my preferred shooting mode when shooting internally on this camera. For those people who are not familiar with the part that is 422, this relates to something called chroma subsampling. To keep things simple, there is only three versions of this you really ever need to know about. That is 420, which is the least desirable. Then there is 422, which is like a middle ground. And then the very best is 4444. 4K 10 bit out of this camera offers incredible dynamic range in V-Log. The colors are great. The only drawback I have found is there's a slight green tint to the shadow slash darker areas, but overall it produces amazing images. If y'all can shoot 50 or 60 frames per second on this camera, you'll have to crop in on that sensor in 4K. Now, I'm not a massive fan of when that happens, but I don't think we can be too critical here as I am not aware any camera at this price point with a full frame sensor that does 50 or 60 frames per second with like a full sensor readout. Taking us nicely onto the 6K open gate. One of the main selling features of this camera was the ability to capture the full sensor in open gate 6K. It's in 10 bit, but it's 420 chroma subsampling. If you remember from earlier, this means that we have fewer colors and this is why my preferred shooting mode is the 4K. 422. There is very little noticeable difference until you start pulling the colors around, doing a lot of grading and stuff like that. And also in mixed lighting scenarios that we'll get to a bit later on. This camera does catch 180 frames per second by going into the S and Q mode on this camera. This though crops into 1080p and I'm really not a big fan of this mode. It's not actually to do with the fact that you are capturing 1080p resolution as I do this all the time on the original Arri Alexa Mini and Arri Alexa. But let's discuss that significant thing that changed the way I use this camera. Capturing RAW, specifically Blackmagic RAW. There is a video on my channel comparing ProRes RAW directly to Blackmagic RAW out of this camera. But the reason I mention this is I feel the weakest point of the image coming out of this camera is mixed lighting scenarios. Now, for example, let's say you have a window in your frame that is a light source at 5600 Kelvin. And in the same frame, you have a lamp on the inside of the building and this is 3200 Kelvin. How do I best describe it? I find the image say muddy. But as soon as you capture RAW out of this camera, it instantly fixes the problem. The RAW out of this camera is super nice and can easily fit and work in any production of any scale. I found the body on this Lumix camera quite good. If you've ever used any kind of Canon or Sony newer mirrorless camera, this is right in line with those. But 
Lumix do tend to give us a lot more professional video features. This camera is definitely tailored heavily on a video side. We get features such as shutter angle and this nice big red record button right here in a nice place where it's natural to press. We also get some nice exposure tools like spot metering and waveforms. I really do wish this camera had false color as for me, false color is the king of exposure. The major headline feature for this camera is autofocus. More importantly, dual pixel autofocus is now usable in video in this camera. I do have a video deep diving into autofocus on this camera and what my favorite settings are. I do wish by now that we would have had a small firmware update addressing some of the functionality to the autofocus. I personally don't think that it's a tracking issue. It's more of a usability issue when it comes to this camera. And also those newer AI detection features from the G92 would be really nice if they could get implemented inside this camera. It ain't the best in the world, that obviously goes to Sony cameras, but I do trust it and I do use it on projects all the time. By far my favorite feature inside this camera is IBIS. There are basically three modes. There is a first mode that is physically moving the sensor inside the camera. Then there is a second mode that physically moves the sensor with added software. Then there is the last mode that is referred to as boost or as a lot of people call it tripod mode. In this mode you can't pan or tilt the camera as it looks really robotic and artificial. But what it's designed to do is as you've guessed, imitate a tripod. This is a hybrid camera, so it does take photos. Now, I'm not the guy to listen to when it comes to photography. It is just not my skill set. But what I can say is I take most of my YouTube thumbnails on this and also do a lot of BTS photography. And I personally think the photos look great. So if you're someone who's a video creator first, but also would enjoy something to take high quality photos on, then you will be more than happy with the results you get from this camera. I don't want to dive into Pacific lenses as, again, I've done a whole video on that on my channel. The L-mount ecosystem is forever growing and there is already some incredible options out there. The prime lenses from Lumix themselves are both affordable and high quality. And also Sigma make all their lenses in L-mount versions. There are some great adapters out there. We'll let you go to all the old EF mount stuff and also let you go to PL to get some PL cine lenses on this. So basically you have a great amount of lens choice when it comes to this camera. Due to my own use case, I don't actually own a cage for this camera, but I've seen some great ones online, so I might pick one of those up soon. I would say my main used accessory is the Dieter D4 mic. I will grab that now. This mic works great with the Lumix. The preamps are decent inside and the battery life's great. I would say my next most used accessory is obviously ND filters. Not having built in ND filters is a big downside when it comes to capturing video. But I recently got sent this kit from Freewell. I just want to clarify that they did not pay me and they do not affect my opinion. I'll get to see whatever I say about this. The kit uses magnets to avoid that awkward screwing the filter on and off. The way this works is you screw on this metal ring that's on already to the front of your lenses. Now you can pick up multiple versions of this. Screw on all your lenses, again, saving time. And then the ND filters themselves, just magnet right on like that. It's super easy to just chuck on. I find this especially useful for when you're demoing, so you can just chuck one on, that's too strong. Filters themselves seem really good and I've not seen any strange colors or tints in my footage as I've been using these off multiple projects. And the kit I received also had a circle polarizer filter inside of it. Now this filter actually saved me on a shot I got recently while filming a Christmas ad. I'll put the shot on screen now. I was filming from inside a house, outside, and you could see the reflection of the camera. So what I did was I put the circle polarizer on, twisted it to reject the reflections that are in glass and windows. And just like that, the reflection of the camera was no longer visible and the shot come out great. And also I get this lens cap that I think was really cool with a little keyring hook thing on the front. And just as you've guessed, these filters are stackable. So you can stack multiple NDs, polarizer NDs. You can stack the UV filter to protect your lens and then stack the ND on top of that. If you're interested in purchasing these, I will put the product link in the description to this video. It's not an affiliate link or I don't get paid at all for you buying them, but they was kind enough to send them me out and I've really been enjoying using them so far. I would share that for you guys. The memory cards I use are these Sabrent uh, V60s when shooting internally on the Lumix. These work absolutely great and they're really affordable. But if you decide to start capturing RAW using a Blackmagic Video Assist, you would need the B90 version of this. 
I'm actually using it right now inside my Ursa Mini Pro. So I can't actually show it yet, but I will put it up on screen and both the B60 and the V90 cards will be linked in the description. The biggest problem I found is that I discovered a dead pixel in some of my footage around six months into using this camera. Upon further investigation, I then discovered I could see it on the back of the screen and realized this must have been a sensor issue. But luckily there is a pixel refresh feature inside the menu. I run it once, it did not fix it. But after running this multiple times, eventually the dead pixel seems to be gone for now. Now this next one caught me off guard. I just didn't do enough research before I bought the camera and it probably caused me the most issues. It was the fact that in this camera, you cannot select H.264 or H.265. Dealing with H.265, you have a dedicated media engine or some kind of chip inside your computer is extremely difficult. Everybody at this production company has a custom built PC. Now they had really decent CPUs with like 32 cores or 16 cores, but None of them was equipped to handle H.265. All the footage we shot, we were having to convert into proxies and even finding major issues when rendering with like the green flashes and glitches. And to top it off, we couldn't even play the footage back when we was plugging the memory card in to see what the footage was and what it looked like. My best advice here is find some H.265 open gate out of this camera, download it and test it on your computer before you think about buying this camera. And then my last issue is trying to power the camera via the USB-C port. This is way more complicated than it needs to be. You can plug one charger in and it totally powers fine, it'll last forever. You can plug another one in and then it will just drain the battery at a slower rate. And to make things more confusing, they can be the same output of watts. It's just to do whether they're QC or DP, something like that, I just really don't know. And to top it off, when you've got the cable plugged in, it shows a little lightning bolt over the battery to tell you you're plugging in external power, but then does not let you know if that's gonna run out or last forever. What becomes an issue because most of the time when you want to continuously power, it's kind of you want to set it and forget it. The way I solved this issue was I jumped on Amazon and bought a dummy battery to mains power. And ever since then I've been fine, but I just feel it should be way simpler than it actually is. Would I purchase this camera again in 2024? Absolutely. I considered the Lumix S52 and 2X to be the best value cameras on sale when it was released. And now I'm seeing all sorts of deals popping up on it. And especially if you're considering getting one used, it's just incredible value for money. I love how you can pick this thing up, chuck an SD card in it with the kit lens and just get shooting. Then gradually as you grow as a creator, you can rig this thing up, start capturing raw, chuck a PL adapter on it with some nice cinema lenses. There is one reason I would advise against buying this camera and watch this video right here to make sure you don't make that mistake.